All right, okay, I'll just start. Um, I'm just going to talk kind of um, informally about what I think uh, is important, uh, kind of directly to the um, theme of this project as well. Uh, the, the title of the um, talk is Who Will Win the Battle of the Bots? Um, and I, broadly speaking, I'm, I'm going to talk about just like whether, um, whether some of the right-wing successes and gains made through online campaigning uh, and algorithm manipulation, targeting advertising and this kind of thing uh, could actually be, be used for, say, left-wing agendas rather than the kind of right-wing and corporate agendas that they seem to have served. So, I mean, people um, reacted with, with quite a lot of surprise when um, those kind of right-wing causes associated with Brexit referendum and the election of Donald Trump uh, were able to like garner massive levels of support via social media. Um, so uh, those campaigns, they kind of mobilised memes and fake news bots and highly sophisticated targeted advertising based on data analytics um, to kind of brainwash and manipulate the voting population, or, or so the argument is. I'm going to kind of take issue with that as well. Um, you know, as we, we've been talking about, it's interesting that these tactics are actually originated in 2008 with the uh, Obama presidential campaign. Um, so uh, they didn't initially have this kind of right wing kind of uh, association, these kind of, these kind of political tactics. But uh, now, today, it seems like quite clear that it's the right rather than the left who are kind of taking advantage so readily of the latest kind of algorithms, dirty online tactics, targeted advertising and so on. Um, so, um, yeah, essentially, um, many liberals and moderates, centrists, uh, have tended to kind of respond to this with a kind of suspicion of social media and new technology. Uh, and part of what I'm kind of arguing here is that that's the wrong approach entirely. Instead, the left needs to not resist these things, um, but actually become creatively and actively involved in the production of new algorithms and new tactics uh, to manipulate and, well, if that's the wrong word, apologies, but I'm, I'm also fine with it, uh, to manipulate the kind of population to their own kind of... Um, Agenda. So the left can cannot like just say we, we tend to kind of moralise about it and say, "Oh, look at these evil tactics that Steve Bannon used," uh, or you know, "Look at these kind of terrible things done by by Cambridge Analytica and so on." Uh, but I think we need a different approach. I mean, there there are obviously moral issues surrounding those things, but the left needs to actually uh, be actively engaging in these kinds of new technologies and using them for their own agendas as well. And that's what I'm going to kind of outline how they might do that. Um, and so, in general, like my difference, I suppose from other people talking about these topics is that it centres around desire. Uh, so I'm basically talking about three things together. I'd say desire, politics, and technology or algorithms as the third thing. So I'm going to kind of triangulate these things. Like, and it's, it has to do with um, pleasure and how the right and corporate uh, kind of political forces were able to put people's pleasure to work online to achieve their political ends. And I'm asking the question of whether the left can imagine a way of uh, putting people to work on the level of desire, the level of pleasure, to achieve their own kinds of things. OK, so uh, first of all, say something about sort of uh, normies and sheeple and things like that as a kind of framework for this. Like, um, it's quite interesting that, um, that uh, this, there are a lot of similarities between um, these kind of attitudes towards Cambridge Analytica and like what I would think of as a kind of far right discourse actually. So first of all, um, there are like loads of in interesting similarities between the Trump presidential run and the Leave campaign in the UK. Um, so Leave.eu, um, which is the, the kind of rowdier, unofficial version of the Leave campaign headed up by Nigel Farage. Um, they, they met with uh, Andy Wigmore, who was um, and uh, Trump's advisers from 2015. So, if you basically what I'm saying is very straightforward. If you trace back the, 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 the two campaigns, the Trump election campaign and the Leave campaign for Brexit, uh, you'll see there are actually concrete kind of uh, connections between them. The same kind of people being involved at uh, different levels. You, fa you found your drink. Sorted. Um, both campaigns, uh, you know, ha had this kind of um, uh, uh, attitude of gaming media cycles, um, and especially uh, 
connected via Cambridge Analytica. So both Leave.eu and the Trump campaign uh, recruited Cambridge Analytica, who kind of promised to revolutionise political campaigning. I'm just going to give a little bit of background of that. Um, so Cambridge Analytica claimed to take the kind of Obama uh, election tactics to a new level uh, using a method which they call psychometrics. Uh, they compile uh, in information based on Facebook likes, um, not just about political allegiances, but specific personality types and emotional states. Um, so then they algorithmically produce a detailed, tailored political content to these people's news feeds, right? So in other words, the, the difference of Cambridge Analytica and former forms of social media marketing for, for political campaigns is that um, not only do they create psychological profiles out of your data, but they, they do it the other way around. So uh, they can search for um, specific profiles as it were, backwards through the data. So you might search for all anxious fathers, for example. You know, Cambridge Analytica had these kind of categories. So target all anxious fathers or all angry introverts or, uh, for example, all undecided Democrats. Um, it's, so it's not really clear how, how much Cambridge Analytica uh, actually were responsible for Trump's election or for the, leave, the success of Leave campaign. Probably those things have been like massively overstated, like the influence of Cambridge Analytica probably has been to some extent overstated. Um, what is clear though is that uh, the logic of it is based on this idea of sheeple and people as a, uh, as a manipulatable Force. And this is like the topic of also of this project. I think this connects very closely. We're, we're calling ourselves an online influencing agency. And I guess this is my point number one from the talk. We should not think of our targets as sheeple or normies. Uh, and I'm going to say why. So normies is the word which refers, which is often used on chan boards, basically referring to, it's like kind of muggles in Harry Potter speak, right? A normie is somebody who is, 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 is a mainstream cultural, not, not subcultural. And specifically, uh, it has the connotation of somebody who hasn't been red-pilled, uh, is the language which is, is found on kind of far-right chan boards and things like that. So if you don't know what a red pill, the phrase red pill means, you know, it comes from the matrix, obviously. It's, it's pardon? Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, the idea that you, you, you know, stepped out of the matrix and can suddenly see the truth of things. Uh, and this is a, a term used um, very regularly among far right groups. Did the term? No. I think, I think no. Um, I think no. I think it's relatively recent. The last sort of five, ten years, this term started to, I don't know, the first time the term is used, but over the last five years, it's become a kind of staple part of like far right discourse. Right, to say, have you been red pilled? Uh, which means you're not one of the sheeple, you're not a normie, you can, you can see the light, you're an influencer, you're a manipulator, uh, and the others, the targets, are the sheeple, the normies. Uh, so actually, I think that uh, the, the, you could almost see far right discussion boards and online communities as a kind of disorganised propaganda office, right? So, you know, we are, we are a, a formal uh, propaganda office of some kind of project here, but you can actually see, you could actually argue that a, an online subcultural disorganised and dispersed propaganda office already operates in service of far right things. And they, they are based, they're, they're basing the idea on the idea of manipulatable normies and sheeple, which oddly chimes with what, how liberals respond to Cambridge Analytica. Okay, so what I'm actually saying is, uh, the way British media, general population, the normies, re reacted to Cambridge Analytica scandal is to say, well, look at this evil company who are manipulating people. And so they, tend, they have tended to see people as normies, sheeple who can be herded, organised, manipulated, consent can be engineered. Okay, that oddly chimes with the far right idea of normie and red pill. So the liberal response to Cambridge Analytica and the far right agenda of manipulating the people towards the Trump election share the view that the subject of propaganda is a normie or, or a kind of sheeple, a, a kind of passive recipient of propaganda who can be manipulated by those who are, as it were, the right side of the matrix, the, 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 those who have been red-pilled. And so my second claim or, or the second part of the claim is that if we are to be successful in uh, having a propaganda office that works for the left, 
uh, having a sense that the bots, the battle of the bots can be fought from a left-wing perspective as well as a right one or a corporate one or a liberal one, the first thing we need to do is change this attitude towards the target of propaganda from uh, a kind of normie or sheeple who is not clued in into a different kind of approach where the target is seen as a kind of active participant in the pleasures of politics and the pleasures of um, of left-wing ideas, which is now what I'll go on to see. So the kind of first point, to repeat again, is you know, if, if the left is going to win the battle of the bots, the first step is to take a different approach to both the liberals and the right by rejecting the idea of the recipient of propaganda as a kind of sheeple or a normie. Okay, so... Um, Good. So uh, I'd like to sort of prove a bit more that, that there's a connection between uh, desire politics and, and technology, which is emerging right now. Uh, if anyone hasn't heard of the website Trump.dating, I suggest you take a look. Um, it's a, very simple. It's a dating website where Trump supporters can find each other and, uh, you know, live happily ever after. Okay, the, uh, it actually made the news because the, the model they used on the major ad campaign was accidentally they selected a sex offender. Um, but but the, more, the more important point for me is that th this points to a kind of interesting connection between politics and desire, and it seems to be a rather a right-wing thing. It's, it's not just a coincidence that there isn't a Corbyn dot dating. You know, it matches perfectly the patterns that you're seeing, that there would be a Trump dot dating, but not a Corbyn dot dating. Um, and so this kind of triangulation between desire, politics, and, and uh, is something that I think should concern the left. Okay. Uh, so, um, again, uh, you can see that um, this has its origins in Obama and leads to Trump. So, I don't sure seem like I'm being too critical of Obama, but there is a kind of lineage here that, you know, Obama's kind of, yes, we can, uh, the famous kind of yes, yes, we can speech, um, you know, which became this kind of catchphrase for Obama's campaign, was a case, I think, of putting the public's desire into action for politics. Right, it, it activated people's desire, this kind of, yes, we can, as a kind of collective putting to work of the people's desire for a political agenda. Right? Now, that, that at the time seemed like something positive, much like the social media marketing that Obama's campaign employed. Now, we, we can see that like, Ch Trump's rhetoric of building the wall or, or things like that is, is another example of putting the people's desire into politics, but it's doing it for a completely different agenda, which is kind of... Uh, surprising. So, um, okay, good. So, um, now um, we need to think about how we can do this differently, uh, and that's what I'll talk about for the next 10 minutes or so before, before we finish. Okay, so I think we've got some examples, some early examples of this happening, like leftist memes are massively on the rise. Um, you know, I'm sure you've, you've all shared some pretty hilarious um, leftist memes recently. Um, and companies like Momentum have begun work in this direction. Like, Momentum is obviously sort of controversial and some people have, have problems with it. But, you know, and for example, Corbyn appearing at Glastonbury and the, the issues around that are, are examples of this. Um, they come up with some really interesting things on, on, on Momentum. The, the um, My Nearest Marginal app is a good example of this, where like um, instead of cold calling, if you want to like campaign for Corbyn, instead of cold calling and so on, like basically tar or like um, balloting in your local area where you're mostly reaching people who have already decided one way or another which way to vote, um, the the app allows you to kind of go to your nearest marginal space. So it will actually instruct you like, okay, instead of wasting your time in in Hornsey and Wood Green or whatever, go to uh, this and such and such a swing borough and so on. And then you get like this kind of meme sharing aspects of that and allows you to kind of um, you know, group together and, and kind of have fun. Like you're kind of, the, the idea is that you're gaming the system, you know, by using a, um, an app, you know. And then this is where momentum have come into criticism as well. So, but in other words, you know, they're doing what um, Bannon's campaign did for Trump and they're doing what Cambridge Analytica have um, regularly um, worked towards, but doing it with a kind of left agenda. And so you, you're, I think you're, you're kind of starting to see the emergence of this in, in both the cultural sphere and the culture wars. You're seeing the, the birth of kind of leftist memeing, um, websites like Bunker Chan and the lefty, the lefty poll boards on 8chan would be kind of early examples of this. And 
I, I think that if the left is to have any success whatsoever, it needs to fully embrace these aspects of itself. We're, we're so uncomfortable. If you, I, mean, I mean, OK, there are some things I wouldn't want to embrace about Bunker Chan and so on. This kind of, there's lots of, kind of hate speech in there. This is not a justification of, of that. It, it's an overall point that if the left is to have any success, it needs to become much more comfortable than it currently is with as it were, propaganda, as it were, gaming the system. In fact, it's rather the wrong terms for thinking about the project in general. Right? The Momentum app is sending you to your nearest marginal so that you can maximise your desire to work for the Corbyn campaign in a way that's actually going to profit and benefit the Corbyn campaign. It, it, it's wrong almost to frame it as gaming the system because the system is no longer the same thing. And, every other aspect and every other political allegiance or political party is using these tactics, right? So uh, you've a, we, are, we have a kind of left which is kind of frozen because, and, and this has actually characterised discussions in this office over the last day and a half as far as I'm concerned. You've got a left which is kind of frozen between saying, are we actually comfortable with doing that? You know, and another side which is like, okay, yes, we have to do that because everyone else is doing it. Right. And uh, th this, this kind of tension between where, where the left stands, is, is, I think, is, is kind of holding it back to, to a large extent at the moment. So it's, you, this is why, I mean, so, so I, I think I gave the example yesterday, it's, it's uh, worth repeating. This is, this is why the right are so readily taking advantage of opportunities and the left aren't. So I mentioned yesterday when, when in 2015, um, Microsoft created this uh, tweeting bot called Tay. Um, and Basically, the idea of Tay, if you don't remember it, it's kind of an AI. All it can do is tweet, respond to people like a person, and so on. And for about 10 minutes, Tay was like saying nice things. How are you doing? She said something even slightly feminist at one point. And after about 10 to 15 minutes, all these kind of right-wing communities on the Chan boards had worked out that there was a huge opportunity here because Tay had 8 million followers from Microsoft. And she is an AI which basically can, she, she will converse with whatever content you put into her. So on the, within, within minutes of her being in existence, uh, the rights were online gathering to come up with ways to get her to say pro-Trump things. You can actually, it's fascinating to actually trace this through. You can see that like on 4chan, politically incorrect board, at like 8.40, people start saying, there's an opportunity here to get some Pepe memes out to 8 million Microsoft followers on Twitter. And then you get hundreds of people going onto the 4chan saying, okay, so what do we need to feed it? What can we do? You get these kind of posts. Then all these posts became deleted. So there are some screenshots of them. So what, what happened was, Tay started saying racist things. She endorsed Trump's presidency. She criticized feminists. She came out, she said something racist about Obama, said something about Clinton, and said that you know, Trump's the only hope we've got for a new America, right? So, so there, and then you've got this other, these other threads on Twitter, people saying, what the hell's going on? All these people on the left on Twitter going, what the hell's going on? P people are feeding that machine stuff uh, and making her say, pro-Trump things, and then other people saying on Twitter, let's do the same, and other people saying, no, we shouldn't do that, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, so, and then so what happened, a few people complained to Microsoft, Microsoft had to take the bot down. Right, so again, that, that like massively characterises the situation, where you've got a right-wing red sitting there on their computers, readily willing to use any opportunity they've got to spread, as it were, propaganda, just to use the terms of this, I wouldn't usually speak like that, but to, to use the terms of this project, readily to spend their, to, to use every kind of algorithmic possibility to spread their propaganda. And on the other hand, you've got a left frozen by morality as it, or something, unable to actually do anything similar, right? So, um, I think this connects to my first point that people shouldn't be seen as sheeple. Um, you know, I think it's possible for a left to come to terms with its implication in, and it's, it's, it's the fact that the mediascape has changed. Right? It is no longer really propaganda. It's no longer gaming the system to use, as it were, dirty tactics, targeted advertising. These are the things that we are playing around with over these few days. Uh, you know, memeing, manipulating news feeds, um, even fake news, bots, things like that. You know, th these, this is no longer uh, a, a, que a question of um, gaming the system because that is how the system is structured and how it works. 
and you've got one important political group, the most important as far as I'm concerned, which I'm calling the left wing for the purposes of ease in this talk, who aren't taking full advantage of that. So that, that's something I think we, we should do. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, uh, okay, so... Um, uh, Good. So to conclude, I think I'll, I'll say two, two, two points. This is all very kind of provisional and, and it's kind of designed so that we can um, start thinking these, hopefully think some of these things through over the next couple of days and also see if it can be integrated at all with what we're actually achieving here. So, so the first point or, or, or point number one is that, that uh, I do think that the left has to... Uh, be part of the battle of the bots, okay? uh, that the media scape has changed, that this battle is taking place. Currently, it's leaning far, far towards right and far right discourses. If not, it's the liberal kind of corporates uh, who, are, who are taking the greatest advantage of these kind of battles. So it's fascinating to me to be part of a project such as this, in, interested in saying, okay, can we provide or explore this kind of missing question of progressive politics in the battle of the bots. In a way, what we're doing here is, is joining the battle of the bots and, and we're asking the question of how, would, how are we going to do that from a kind of progressive um, perspective. Uh, I think that's a vital question to be asking, which is kind of why I applied for this, this project. And I have two pieces of advice, both things I've said already, uh, for what, how that should happen if it's going to work. And the first is to drop the idea of um, influencing a passive normie slash sheeple uh, as the target, and replace it with an idea that the recipient is, you know, kind of prosumer, kind of active consumer of political propaganda. It is no people who receive things, whether that's on Twitter, Facebook, 4chan, in this day and age, they they do not receive it innocently as a lie. You know, very rarely, in my opinion, does fake news actually work because people believe it. That is not the way it works. People are actively engaged productively, creatively engaged in the consumption, reproduction, dissemination of these materials. So your target of your propaganda, if there is such a thing as, as a progressive propaganda that we're working, the target has to be activated as an active user, not as somebody whose opinion to be swayed by lies, by manipulation. They have to be put to work actively in the process, and that is how you politicise the recipients. Not, not by seeing them as a sheeple, like Cambridge Analytica did, or a normie, like the alt-right people did, but as somebody who's who can be put to work actively in the production of, of propaganda. That, I think, would give the left an advantage over those other groups, actually. That is where they could win the battle of the bots, if they could be the first to, to see that point and target them, their, their recipients of propaganda in a very different way. Okay, so that's point one. And point two is uh, the question of desire. It has to be pleasurable, okay? Uh, this hasn't been a funny talk, but the stuff we put out has to be connected to humour, connected to pleasure. You know, think of things like... I mean, and momentum is structured like this to a certain extent. It's thing, like, I'm a very big fan of things like the video game Corbin Run, which is just like a, a kind of Corbin Mario, uh, and uh, things like this. I think that, you know, if... if propaganda is to be successful, it has to be pleasurable. And th there's a huge kind of distance here between the left and the right as well. Just think of Pepe, God Emperor Trump. You know, it's funny. It works. When, when, just let me give that example of Sheila Booth's art projects, right? Sheila Booth was doing these ridiculous art projects. Okay, I think he put an American flag in the desert or something sometime. And there was a video... Um, this is a great example to show the problem, I think. Uh, there's a video of, of this American flag that Sheila Booth had put in a desert somewhere. This was the art installation that he, he was doing. I, I think I've got it slightly wrong. In any case, the alt-rights gathered on 4chan and they showed two things. They showed how tech-savvy they are compared to the left because all this video showed was a blank desert based on flight patterns of, of planes going across the background of the video. They worked out where it was. Right? So over a course of about three hours, loads of tech-savvy right-wing activists worked out from almost no information where exactly in the world this flag was and where Sheila Booth's camera was. Okay? Then they found uh, a right-wing activist who was relatively close to that space anyway, told them to drive out there and replace the American flag with a Pepe flag. Now, that is very funny, and the humour of it is, is, is not missed on it, like the people on 4chan. Like, it, it's, 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 a, it's a joke, it's parodic, it's satire. It's the spread of Pepe as a kind of humorous replacement for American politics. And, 
and, uh, and also a complete mockery of Shia Labu. So this, this example actually shows the two things at once, right? The tech savviness of far-right communities, which the left is lacking, and the ability to put humour and, and pleasure to work for their political agendas, which the left is also lacking. So these are my two kind of reasons for doing this talk. I, I wanted to sort of make these two points. Okay, who will win the battle of the bots? The way it's going, far-right discourse will. The left can win the battle of the bots, but it has to do these, these things. It has to be much more tech savvy than it has currently been, ready to use technology in ways which, it might, which might sometimes be uncomfortable, um, not seeing the recipient as a mere sheeple to be manipulated, but someone to put to work co collaboratively and collectively for political gains, and finally funny and interested in pleasure and, and, and making this a this process of politics libidinal, you know, operate on the level of desire. And, and you know, that, that has happened, okay? Let's say Obama is a, is a this is sort of extreme. Obama, Obama is a kind of neoliberal centrist who put people's desire to work for his campaign. Trump is a kind of middling to far right, uh, horrible <laughs> ass who put people's desire to work for his campaign. And Corbyn is the first example of a possibility of putting desire to work for the left. And I think that's something promising, uh, but it yeah, needs to be backed up by a left willing to do all these things and engage the digital space in all these kind of new ways, which I've tried to suggest. OK, so that was quite rambling, but I think, you know, you can see that there are, just, um, there are some key points there, which I definitely don't have the answers to. So, if you, if, you know, I don't exactly know how to do those things, but it's my general sense that, you know, if the left is to win the battle of the bot, these are the three or four things that it really needs to, to do to have a chance. So hopefully uh, you found some of that at least thought-provoking and you know, it'd be great if, if well, even if you, if you disagree, then, then say so. Um, if you broadly agree, then it'd be great if we can kind of pull ideas and think about how, to, how we might actually achieve some of those things uh, for, for those kind of progressive agendas. Okay, thank you for listening. I think that's fine. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Do you think that, you know, you were saying about the um, alt-right being technologically way ahead of the left, do you think there's anything to do, I mean, research and kind of anything to do with age? Anyway, mm -hmm. I'm not saying there aren't lots of young, young left that's, that's the Is it to do with um, age and also use of, of, of specialism? I've personally experienced a lot of resistance from older left-wing people mm. to using this technology. Yes. Yes, uh, the age question is uh, it's difficult to answer because I think uh, statistically the younger, the more left-wing in America and here. And we've got obviously Miranda here who's like making that point that like if, if her age group could have voted, they would be more likely to vote against Brexit and for left-wing stuff. So the, the, it, this actually runs against the age demographic. Uh, so it's, it make, that makes it even more concerning to me that why is it that on average young people are more and more, because these are young people, the, it, sorry, I should have made that clear, the average 4chan, 8chan user is young, yeah, uh, uh, 30s at the oldest, at the oldest end, uh, and, and starting in the teens. Um, so that makes it even more concerning to me that the average is that young people tend to be uh, you know, open to left-wing ideas but what we've got is a, sm so a smaller group of much more active, uh, you know, and I do believe that those groups actually had a, a, a it's difficult to compare, but they, I'd say I'm, I'm more worried by the effect they had in Brexit and the Trump election than I am about Cambridge Analytica. You know, I think those online pockets of young people did significantly influence um, the, I mean, for example, I don't think Trump would have got elected without Pepe. You know, I, I think that's, and I, I can't prove that with data, but I think it's, I think people would generally agree that that point. And that's, that's really scary because it's, a, it is a minority, not the average young person. But yeah, why, why is it that the, so what, I don't know why is that, that there is this small group of kind of tech savvy right wing things. And then the question about specialism, yeah, that, that might answer it a bit better. Um, I think there's a misconception that sort of, um, Hacking is, is left-wing. Even Anonymous is, is sort of oddly right-wing at times. 
Um, you know, Silicon Valley has this reputation as being left wing, and it's just, just a lie, really. Um, they're, they're <laughs> pardon? Right wing service. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> Uh, people over the age of 65 are more likely to share fake news. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, make, that, that, that reads right to me. And I think, though, that the, they're, the, they're the, the normies who are, who, are, who are falling. You know, the over 65, not tech-savvy sharer of fake news on Facebook is the normie falling for the tricks of the Pepe disseminating youth on 4chan. So they're probably the target. The, the, the 4chan people probably are targeting those older people likely to disseminate this stuff. Yeah, go on. Yes. 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 Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I think there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, th this, this reminds me of the, uh, the book by Angela Nagel called Kill All Normies, um, which you know, is very controversial. And she seems to be sort of drifting a bit to the right herself, which is making me kind of suspicious of it. But, um, but I do, broadly speaking, think it's, it's a brilliant book, and I, I like what she did. She, she showed how actually the left is to blame for the rise of the right in a certain way because of this kind of factionism that you're talking about. Uh, and I've got a direct suggestion for how to fix that, is that, that it's strange that there isn't any significant anonymous left-wing community online. Because what, what's so significant about those right-wing communities is the anonymity built into it. And it's almost like anonymity <coughs> is right-wing now. If you had an anonymous left-wing community online, you wouldn't really be able to call each other out in that way. It, it's a sort of, the, the site itself compels you to this is actually why I think it's, it's more to do with the structure of the websites than the politics of the people using them. The, the structure of 4chan, it forces you to be a, a community moving in a kind of similar direction because you actually can't really call someone out. You, know, you, you can send a racial slur or something or argue with someone's point, but you can't call people out in the way that the left does on, on Facebook and Twitter. So I think there's, there's something... Yes, you're right, these are tr trends, okay? The left could stop being so factionalist and think about greater levels of solidarity between themselves. Is presumably, that's what you're getting at. And I, I think that needs to happen. But also, what, all, what also is happening there is that the format of the, the sites that they're using is, is <coughs> kind of fostering that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, it does kind of... Yeah, just kind of, it's kind of bleak in that way. Uh, yeah, I was, I was recently at the Left Forum in New York, which is basically this kind of gathering of lefties, and it was just like, no, nothing was achieved, because it was just like tw like 100 different little left-wing groups bickering amongst themselves and hating each other. Uh, and that does kind of characterise the, the Twitter left. <laughs> um, and yeah, one, one of the other tasks, I guess, is yeah, how to kind of create more kind of solidarity on those platforms and stuff. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I can go. Um, go the just gained the system because the system is the same anymore, but should mm. be an approach to restore the system so it wasn't any better at all? Could this kind of system was set up by the right wing, or should the left wing? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let's overthrow capitalism. That would be the way to do it. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, I do agree with you that... But I think what I was trying to say, I, I think I just sort of rambled and didn't say the point very clearly, is it, that it shouldn't be seen as gaming the system because that is how the system works. That we're the only people not gaming it. So it's not really gaming it. It's actually not using the system at all. You know, it's, it's kind of opting out of, of doing it somehow, opting out of being part of it. You know, if, if, every, if, if, if there's like... If you're playing a game with 10 people and nine of them are not playing by the rules, you know, you're not doing any good by playing by the rules. You know, the, the, whole, the whole game is actually based on not by playing by the rules. Uh, so, so, yeah, no, I'd rather we didn't live in that kind of structure. 
Uh, but I think in the meantime, until we can overthrow capitalism, <laughs> um, the left needs to, to yeah, not, not try and play by this kind of imaginary rule set, which isn't actually there. Sorry, do you want well, to say something? I can well, go there. Do you believe common agricultural policy is not good for the environment, animal welfare, so soil quality and sustainability. Which is it? Left, right or centre? <laughs> what was the first part? <coughs> I said CAP, you know, common agricultural yeah. policy. Yeah. Um, I voted to leave the EUC because of that. Yeah. And I believe CAP is not good for the environment, animal welfare, soil quality and sustainability. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I probably so agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, 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 well, I, I, prob I, I, I agree with you that it's, it's not good, <laughs> for, and not for those good, for those reasons and others. Uh, I, I prob I think probably what your question is points out is that I'm, I'm rather lazily using these terms of rights, left, and, and centre. Uh, it's much better in some cases not to, um, but. Liberal. You're, yeah, okay, but no. I mean, I, I no, find no, it useful. It I mean, uh, it kind of happened to, I yes. I leaving the EUC. Yeah, I mean, listen, I don't, I don't, I don't dis have a problem with people who voted <laughs> in any sort of way, but I think for me, it's, it's like, this came up yesterday in our discussion, like, we, we, we came to the point, where, okay, let's stop using these terms like left, right, liberal, you know, and yeah, so it's difficult to answer to your question, like, okay, if I believe X, Y, Z, does that categorise me as, you know, yeah, a left, right? right. But, but to me, they, 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 in a, so depending on the terms of the, the conversation, um, you know, they can be useful. It, in, in this case, I'm, I'm using the terms to point out that there's something missing. I, I guess I'm using the term the left as a kind of, just a kind of stopgap term for something which I think is missing in the online political spectrum. Whereas I think these other political things, you know, conservatism, okay, far right discourse, neoliberalism, new liberalism, those things are well represented and something isn't well represented. I'm calling it the left for the purpose of kind of getting the point across. But it could, there is that, yes, that is the kind of, in a certain way, lazy way of approaching yeah, it. I was going to say, yeah. uh, <laughs> what about CRISPR technology? Gene yes, okay. Gene. What about CRISPR? Uh, Do I have a view on that? It's used, yeah. to be used uh, for good or ill. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's only six years old, so yep. we never had it before. Yeah. And there's no intellectuals, no debate in Parliament. Medical or agricultural. Hmm. Yeah, my my, um, my I was um, thinking of we can have wheat with um, lower get back to Tudor wheat, wheat uh, mm -hmm. Tudor bread. You can get uh, less gluten content, uh, more less air bubbles, heavier, yep. and more nutritious. <laughs> That's Tudor style. So mm. using soft can I have some of that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my view of, of the ratio between politics and technology, I suppose the only kind of interesting or semi-thoughtful insight I've got there is that uh, we should certainly do away with the idea that new technologies do not have an inbuilt politics when they emerge. I think we tend to think, okay, this new technology is here uh, and then we have to deal with it how it is. Like, is it going to be used for good or is it going to be used for bad? But it's politics which governs which technologies are developed. It's not like the natural developments of human beings or anything. It's politics which governs what projects get funded and what projects don't. So when new technologies emerge, they're already biased in a political way. Um, they're not just the result of the great advancement of human society. You know, there's already a politics. When something arrives on the scene in the, in the world of tech, such as CRISPR, already a politics has, has... So it's already kind of biased. It's already been funded by certain bodies and who have made decisions about which technologies to fund and which ones to not. This is why I think robots are kind of right-wing and liberal. You know, if you, if you, like, talk to Sophia or see any other kind of robot or s and also <laughs> sex robots, which I'm researching at the moment, you know, tend to be very patriarchal, tend to be kind of... Uh, kind of <laughs> 
strange, and they, they, because the actual process of creating the technology has already got this kind of inbuilt bias. So we actually have these kind of the bots themselves, in a way, have inherited a bias from the politics of the cultures which made them, and so on. You can see that with the racist facial recognition algorithms, uh, and with lots of dating algorithms and things like that. And this is another way in which the left needs to become kind of more critically engaged in the production of new technologies. Um, because, yeah, not, it's not just a case of using what's been produced. It's a case of producing new robots, which think like us, or something like that. Yeah? Um, thank you for your talk. That was brilliant. brilliant, brilliant. Um, I have two questions. Firstly, I was wondering if um, there's the possibility of mythologizing a far more unified right from the perspective of an outsider. Yes. That whether being in the right, it might look like there are many more divisions than we Yes. yes. And whether the, so the second question is, um, in terms of why the left is so fractional, part of that might be related to an exercise in criticality. And, and if, you know, always critically thinking about ourselves. And if, in terms of the prospect of abandoning that, whether there might be a mm. danger of throwing the baby out of the bar. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. Uh, so I'll just answer the second point first. I, I completely agree. I don't think I probably agree, Ophelia, we weren't saying that the left should stop critically evaluating itself. But there are also moments when the solidarity is required instead, right? Uh, so as long as it can be that way round, right? So, you know, spending most of the time criticising and critiquing each other, debating things through so that the points get uh, critically interrogated and, and move on in interesting ways. But then when the time comes showing the sufficient solidarity with each other that's required is probably the, the, the way to kind of go about that. What, what's Even some of the sort of abuse that I, I've received from just various articles I wrote and something does go beyond like the critical evaluation yeah. and just descend in, and it is sometimes coming from people who define, describe themselves as being on the left as well as, as, well as on the right. Uh, um, and uh, the first part was what? Well, um, <laughs> when, uh, from the oh yeah, 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 got it. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely. And are you, I mean... Yeah, I mean, of course, I'm familiar with these arguments that almost that one shouldn't really study the, the alt-right as a, as a coherent group because you're part of continuing this mythology that they are there as this big, scary other. Um, I think the genuine fear of what they can do outweighs the worry that I'm overblowing their role, uh, so continue to study it. But uh, your point is important as well, that it's actually their diversity and, and fragmentation which is part of the political power. Uh, that they, they have, right? It's, it isn't a coherent group of like-minded people. Um, but it does seem to be one, like I was saying, the left should be, which can mobilise as a coherent group when it wants to achieve something collectively. If, if you look on, on one of those Chan boards, you, you won't see a group of people who seem like they agree with each other. Not at all. But when the Clinton emails leaked, they united to use it to, to ensure that she lost votes in key states. So they were able to, you know, slag each other off 99% of the time, but have the solidarity to achieve a collective end when the time came to do that. And we should probably, I mean, that's probably the only way in which we should emulate the old right. <laughs> but it could, it could be worth thinking about. I think it's a good, good question to, to ask. Any more things? I think we've, we could get back to making some propaganda. <laughs> uh, thank you anyway for listening. I enjoyed the discussion a lot. Great. Thank, thank you. you. See you.